Well, good morning and welcome to the 33rd meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee. Um, decision one is a, a decision on item one to take items four, five and six in private. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Thank you. Um, this morning we have apologies from Colin Beatty, Dean Lockhart and Andy Whiteman. And we have Willie Coffey and Tom Mason sitting as substitutes. I would ask everyone in the public gallery to turn off any electrical devices to silent, please. And we now turn to the item on our agenda, the business support inquiry. We have three witnesses with us this morning whom I would welcome at this stage. Uh, first of all, Andrew Dixon, Fund Manager, Business Loan Scotland. Keith Devine, Senior Director of Business Banking, the Royal Bank of Scotland, and Professor Gary McEwen, who's the Chief Executor, uh, sorry, Executive, not Executor, hopefully, <laughs> for Elevator. Um, so welcome to all three of you this morning. Just to say that the microphones will be operated by broadcasting, there's no need to press any buttons. So if you do want to come in um, to the discussion at any point and don't feel you're making it in, just raise your hand so I can bring you in. Um, I'll start with a question generally to the three of you, which is what do you think of the provision of access to finance for SMEs in Scotland? Um, are there, is there sufficient finance provided and available to small to medium-sized enterprises in Scotland? Uh, are there specific difficulties that SMEs in Scotland face gaining access to finance? Who would like to start? Uh, Andrew I'll, st I'll start. Um, I'm, I'm here representing Business Loan Scotland, so we're a local authority-backed uh, loan fund. So we've got the money in the bank, effectively, to be able to lend to SMEs. And predominantly, our uh, market is new and growing uh, young young businesses. So I think there's definitely room for improvement in terms of when it comes to access to finance. I think there's been a number of initiatives most uh, more recently where there's been more financial products out there. I'm not sure to what extent we are totally aware uh, of what each other is doing. And uh, that's certainly the case, I think, for small and medium-sized businesses to understand what's actually available. What, what form would that, I think you mentioned there's a need for more access to finance, what form could that take? In terms of, of financial products? Well, you tell me. Um, I, think, I think there's a good range of financial products out there from your microfinance to your debt finance and to uh, your equity finance. The bit that I'm interested in, that I'm responsible for, is the debt finance between 25,000 and 100,000 pounds. So that's what I'm probably most able to, to talk about. But I think there's a good range of uh, financial uh, products out there. Um, it's making sure that businesses, when they actually need funding, know where to go and how to, to access it. And, and if they do that, uh, is there sufficient financing there for businesses, in your experience? Yes, I think it's improving. I think the range and the amount of funds that are available are definitely greater uh, now than perhaps they were a number of years ago. So I think the range and the amount of funding that's available has definitely increased. Right, would either of our other guests like to come? Professor McEwen. Um, so I represent um, Elevator, which um, for those who don't know, we deliver almost 25% of all of Business Gateway startups for um, Scotland. Um, we have many business advisors who are recruited to to connect people to this finance um, as one of their roles but they these advisors have to have a very broad range of skills available to them um, but the, the navigation of the funding mechanisms is perhaps the most difficult part of the advisor's job to, to try and navigate through the the very many uh, different places that can that where access to finance can be found um, so the, there is a lot out there, but it's very it's complex. And uh, what's up, what the other issue is that the, these entrepreneurs who really should be focusing on building reputation and credibility, building companies, can spend too much time continually looking at the next round of funding. And, we'll, and it's such a time-consuming 
So entrepreneurs will often reflect after four or five years of the journey and, and just they think they've become funding experts because that's, that's the, the problem we have is that it's not really that joined up. There's not a roadmap um, that would be helpful for what is a small country. And that, how, how could that be improved? Um, I think the... I do agree that there is, there's plenty out there. Um, however, it's, it's, it, there's sometimes too much in one area of a business growth um, in terms of its timeline. When a business is just beginning, nobody really wants to touch it because there's too many unknowns and too little to go on. Uh, funding available for businesses which are in growth mode is, is much easier. Um, so we, we do have a lot, I agree, but I don't think we have it evenly spread on the journey of a business. I think we need to do more for startups. We need to do more for the early stage growth ones because the market kind of takes care of stuff after that, in my view. Um, we could, how we can help the situation is by, by, I think, having perhaps more of a CPD process within the Business Gateway programme to allow the business advising community to have a better grasp on how they might navigate through the... They, they, you, they could seriously spend all their time just raising money for clients because it's, it's such a tough uh, thing to do. And that would mean they couldn't do their business, presumably? Or does it yeah, stop th them focusing on the business? I think um, if I was to try and sum up my, my view is that the, the, the task of raising money to grow a company is an onerous one. And it takes a disproportionate amount of time from our, entrepreneur, our entrepreneur's um, workload. Uh, time that could be more valuably spent actually building the business. Um, until they get to the point when they can have a finance director who can maybe take control of that. But in the early stages, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's difficult. I think uh, a lot of new businesses and young businesses, you find the principal, the owners, the directors are working in their business as opposed to on their business. And I think that's a key change that I think entrepreneurs need to be able to make uh, and business owners need to be able to make in terms of they need to be able to have the teams around them that can actually do the day-to-day -day stuff that's required to grow, start up and develop that business to allow the, the principal, the, the director, the managing director to be able to work on their business and undertake those tasks of looking at how they're going to access new markets, how they're going to raise funding, how they're actually going to go and create the opportunities that will uh, then create the jobs that we're, that we're looking for, certainly from an economic development perspective. And Mr. Devine, is RBS ready to lend money to start up businesses? Um, I think in short, the answer is, is yes. Um, we are very proud of the fact that we bank one in three of businesses in Scotland. Um, the sector of the bank that I'm involved in um, is the startup to two million pound turnover phase. Um, and we have around about 111,000 customers um, who are in, in that sector. Um, we support businesses in a, a variety of ways. So we have a team of 65 relationship managers who work locally with customers to find out what they need and what, how we can help. We have a team of eight business growth enablers. These are individuals who don't have day-to-day -day responsibility of supporting active customers. Um, their job is to be the public face of the bank, to let customers know about the wider ecosystem in Scotland, to see who can support, and that's both internally within the Royal Bank and externally. Um, we are trying to make it much easier for customers to, to access finance, um, and we've taken various initiatives, um, such as looking at you know, pre-approved limits. So customers who haven't approached us for funds, we are going to them and proactively saying, based on what we know about you, this is how much we think that we can lend you. Um, of our 9,000 or so customers who are looked after by our relationship managers, we've got around about £168 million worth of funding that has been approved, the, that we are simply waiting on a customer saying, yes, I would like that funding. Um, to date, of the 168 million that we've made available, only 12 million has been taken up. So we would see it as a demand problem rather than a supply problem. However, I would echo what my colleagues have said, that um, one of the things where we can improve is to, to signpost better in terms of the range of support that's available from banks, different agencies, 
um, the, 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 the growth bodies who are out there, because I think it's fair to say that not every customer knows who can offer what. I mean, I think some of the criticism that might be made of that sort of scenario is presented is that b businesses say the funds may be there, but they, they can't get the lending or they can't get it on long-term reasonable conditions. Um, I think that we, we, we seek to, to offer competitive terms that are, that are market-facing, that are right for the business. Um, we are we're in the business of, of lending money to sustainable companies who are in a position to, to pay it back in the, the, the future. We don't seek to put unnecessary conditions or charge at prohibitive rates. Um, we want to, to, to offer fair terms for the individual deal that's put in front of us. But I'll come to Jackie Bailey now. Um, can I drill down into some of the responses that you've been giving to the convener um, and, and maybe just make the observation that uh, certainly immediately post the banking crash, it was a supply problem rather than a demand problem. Um, and I wonder on that basis, do you think competition in SME banking has improved? Is there more choice out there now for some a business coming for a loan? And I wonder whether I could start with Keith Devine. Um, I think competition is a, is a great thing. Um, it, it ensures that banks continue to, to innovate, um, where banks will seek to, to, to be different, um, to, to differentiate not just the blind supply of funds, but what else we can offer a business or an entrepreneur or a community. So we seek to do this by, as I say, not, not simply supplying funds, but to, to connect people, to, to offer advice, to offer free events, and that's to, to both our customers and non-customers, um, really to make sure that um, customers are aware of, of what the options are uh, available. I do take your point that, that 10 years ago that perhaps there, 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 there was a supply problem, but I think that things have moved on significantly since then, and our experience is that we have funds available to lend to the right business who are able to, to, to pay that loan back in the, in the future. It's not in anybody's interest, bank, economy, customers, for us to lend money that is not affordable, that, that can't be paid back. So we're at pains to make sure that we are tailoring the right package to the right customer. How much has your overall lending portfolio increased by since, say, 10 years ago? Um, I'll be happy to, to come back to you for, um, for on the 10-year figures. What I can tell you is since the start of, of 2018, um, our, um, our asset book has grown by about 5%. Um, previous year, um, it grew by around about 7%. Okay. Do any of the other panel have observations on that? Point about competition. I think <coughs> there is a good level of, of competition. I still think the four major banks still dominate the Scottish market in terms of providing facilities for overdrafts and in term loans. But the whole raison d'etre for Business Loan Scotland is to come and fill that gap when the private sector is not prepared to do it. And that might be because the banks don't, uh, are not prepared to do it for a number of reasons. It might be to, to do with risk, it might be to do with uh, lack of security, etc. So our whole raison d'etre is to try and get the funds available to the business that they need to deliver that uh, project, uh, that uh, plan uh, and the timescale that uh, they, they require to do it. So Business Loan Scotland is relatively new. We've been going about 18 months. Uh, and before that, some of you may have heard of either the West of Scotland Loan Fund or the East of Scotland Investment Fund. So we've merged into what is now a Scotland-wide uh, loan fund. And uh, we will go where uh, the demand is. Um, but we are there, as I say, to try and fill that gap that is left by the private sector. Otherwise, there would be no uh, remit uh, for us to really get involved from an economic development perspective because the private sector would be doing what the private se uh, sector is uh, supposed to do, but that gap definitely exists. Professor McEwen. The, <clears throat> the last 10 years has seen a, a real change in the landscape. Um, 10 years ago, the banks largely withdrew uh, into their shell for a while. <clears throat> I'm not sure that we've seen... I have to say that the Royal Bank of Scotland has been to me, the most active player in the market um, of all the banks. Um, the rest have, 
they, they don't have too much appetite for the the early stages of, a, of an organisation because the it's just broadly too high risk and too much effort, I think. Royal Bank are possibly the exception to that. They are very active. Um, but we have seen other products, uh, peer-to-peer -peer lending and crowdfunding. And there's many things have come in in the last 10 years, which has, <coughs> I think, broadened the, the range of the menu. And I think that's a healthy... But there are still gaps. It's good to see local authorities becoming involved to fill some of those gaps. But there are more things that can be done. There, there are examples that, that we are certainly trying to emulate um, from, from Europe, where the business startup community and the banks can work better together. Um, and I think we would do well to copy some of, some of what they are doing. Okay. Um, I think it, it's right to say that there's been an impressive growth in kind of the alternative finance sector. But actually, is it not true that this accounts for still a very tiny proportion of what's out there? Um, so I'd be keen to hear what, what, I mean, colleagues will explore further with you what you think um, we can learn from, from other countries. Um, but what actions do you think need to be taken now to improve that landscape? Mr Devine. I think that there, there's still a perception issue um, where people perceive that, that, that banks don't want to lend um, and it's up to us to, to, to get past that. It's not up to our customers to, to, to come knocking on our door um, and, and coming asking for, for, for funding. We've got to make them aware that we are there, we've got to be proactive, we've got to tell customers about the, the successes that we're that we're having, um, and and make sure that um, that that they are aware that there is an appetite to to lend. Um, I think we also need to, to to help prepare businesses that are in the the, the pre-funding stage, um, where we are either offering advice, you know, one to one or in, in groups, or alternatively to to signpost when a business might actually benefit from from going to to another agency. So I think that um, we we all accept that these days accountants um, don't simply survive by completing a, a set of annual accounts once a year. They are in the market now to, to offer advice. Um, and whilst that advice can be very good on occasion, normally it's advice that, that the customers are charged for. Um, so that it may be that they are not actively um, promoting the, the services of accelerator hubs, of business gateway, or other agencies who are in a position to, to perhaps help with grant funding as opposed to, to debt funding. Can I take that one stage further? Because obviously raising awareness with businesses um, is critically important. Is it the accountants you target, or who else in the business would you target to increase their awareness and understanding of what's out there? We we will target anybody who who we can we can talk to. Um, so that that would be customers. Um, it, it would be accountants. It would be solicitors. Um, really, we, we we want to spread the message as, as far and wide as as we can, um, because ultimately, as I said earlier on, um, we we thrive when Scotland thrives. Um, when when businesses are doing well, we do well. Um, but we 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 need to lend to the right businesses. Um, on the right terms, where there is a realistic prop, uh, you know, chance that we are going to get our, our cash back in the future. Does removing relationship managers from the branch network help that process? So, um, I think it's fair to say that the, the relationship manager is a, is a cornerstone of the, mm -hmm. um, the service that we provide. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's what differentiates us from other banks in as far as we've got the, the, the biggest network of, of relationship managers. Um, you, you, you've mentioned branch closures. Um, however, in reality, um, our relationship managers are tasked with actually going out to businesses as opposed to, to, to saying, you know, Miss Bailey, would you like to come in and, and, and see us? You know, that, that may have been the case 20 years ago. However, we recognise that businesses want to be seen at a time and place that's convenient for them. So we strive to, to do that. It gives us a better insight into to a business where we can wander about, we can see things, it sparks good discussions. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we don't rely on customers coming in to a, a bank branch and sitting in our office to discuss lending. Mm -hmm. Well, just as well, because you've got fewer of them. Andrew Dixon. What I would say is that uh, businesses will, first of all, I think, <coughs> turn to their bank or their accountants for that professional advice, particularly when it comes to raising uh, funding. 
And if they can raise the money from the banks, all well and good. There's no need for funds like Business Loan Scotland to, to get involved. But the entry point to us is through the network of local uh, authority economic development teams and the Business Gateway Service. So that's where we rely heavily on the network of economic development officers, business gateway advisors uh, on the ground at the local level, that when they're working with businesses and identify a business uh, indeed that is to raise funds, then we are one of perhaps the solutions that is available, if, if, particularly if it's relevant to, to raise funding in the range that we can offer of, of 25 up to, to 100. But I think the starting point for businesses is going to their own uh, professional advisors, the banks, and their accountants, sometimes their solicitors. So we try to get our message out there uh, to all the banks and also uh, the accountants. Uh, okay. Because we don't know when that business is going to be looking for funding, but we just need to make sure that the network is aware that we exist and that we've got uh, the facilities uh, to support that business, uh, particularly in filling that gap if they have one. Okay. Professor McHugh. You, you asked them about how this could be improved. The the fundamental problem is that when you're in an SME, if you're an entrepreneur trying to start or grow, then you're in the risk business inherently, and the banks are not in the risk business. So that's the problem. Um, how we solve that? <clears throat> um, you mentioned relationship managers. I think they went some way before to bridging that mm -hmm. by giving the institution some comfort that they were in control and they assessed the situation. With, so that's a, that is a loss um, to us. The fact that it's it's going to you know there's a lot of it is going to computer says yes or no, which scares entrepreneurs a lot, scares them away from borrowing. But we do have some examples. If you will, you'll be aware of the Scottish Edge, um, which to me is a it's a masterstroke of bridging that gap between the risk and the the risk aversion. So you've got Royal Bank of Scotland supporting it, the Hunter Foundation and Scottish Government. And now you're, now you're blending people with different risk appetites into something which does bridge a gap. And Business Loan Scotland and many of the like, I think we probably need to acknowledge that banks and entrepreneurs talk sometimes in a different language and it's maybe up to all of us to think about how we create different models that bridge the gap. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Bailey, if oh, I could sorry. Just come, come in. Of on the subject of computer says no, um, okay. I, I think that um, at Royal Bank, um, on the occasions where um, we, we we do try to, to use technology to, to, to speed up lending decisions, the times when the computer says no, it actually doesn't say no, it says refer. And, and what we do is we then refer that lending uh, decision to a human being who can look at it to say, Actually, is there, is there more to this deal than meets the eye? I.e., it's, it's not square pegs and square yeah. holes. Um, and sometimes the you know the, the decision will still be not yet. But we then have a conversation with that customer to say, actually, this is what we would need to do in order to make a deal viable for you and for the for the bank. So whilst technology does play an important part in, in what we do we still have human beings who are there to look at the, the, a deal to say, does this stack up? Or could we you know, tinker with the, 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 the deal so that it, it is the right thing for both the bank mm -hmm. and the customer? Ultimately, you know, we, we've spoken about risk. The risk to the bank and the risk to the entrepreneur are the, are the same. And we, we both want to manage and minimise that risk and make sure that we're doing the right thing for the customer who is in front of us at that particular point. Um, that was useful to know. I'm glad humans are still involved. And I think if I was to reflect, you know, my view um, is my local businesses miss having the relationship manager on their high street. It's somebody they could trust and who the, the bank obviously had trust in as well. So I think we are, we are missing something. But anyway, convener, thank you very much. Thank you. Angela Constance. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I would be very interested to hear um, about what we have uh, learnt since the Royal Bank of Scotland uh, debacle with the global restructuring group. Um, people will be aware that this was a service that was meant to be supporting uh, small businesses uh, that were struggling. It was closed in 2013 and there was a, a subsequent FCA um, inquiry 
that concluded that while some of the businesses transferred uh, by the RBS into restructuring division were not viable, but of those who were judged to have sound prospects, the FCA found one in six had been damaged through GRG's management of them, uh, including through higher interest rates and new fees. So I would be interested to know what we've learned, particularly given that Brexit is in some shape or form is around the corner, and um, has trust uh, been rebuilt? And I'll start with Mr Devine. Um, I think that the, the, the main learning that, that, that we have is that when, when we are looking at you know, lending uh, proposals that come across our, our, our desk just now, the, the, the key thing that we, we look about at um, is can that business service and support the debt that they're, they're, they're taking on, um, both in the current climate where interest rates are at historically low levels, um, but we also start to, to look at well, what happens if the economic landscape does change. How could that business um, support that loan if interest rates were to, to perhaps increase? Or alternatively, what would happen if a competitor opened you know, um, alongside their business and, and turnover reduced? Um, does, does the deal still stack up? Are we um, you know, lending in a responsible fashion so that the business can, can meet its obligations both now and in the future? Um, there are no guarantees. There, there will be times when we will, we will lend cash and something happens to, to, to that business that, that puts it in difficulty in you know, months or, or years to come. Um, we have closed the, the, the global restructuring group. Um, we, we do, however, still have um, specialists who are, are there to, to help businesses in times of you know, highly stressful situations. Um, and, so, and so we are there to support the customers that we have. Okay, do other members of the panel wish to contribute on this? I'm not sure I can add much more than that, but uh, I think we need to bear in mind that we should be treating the customer fairly. Um, okay. so. Indeed. Uh, Professor? Um, much as I, I'm very happy to answer questions, but this is definitely, definitely not my sweet spot. Okay. <laughs> um, Given uh, that we've already mentioned the B word, uh, that'll be uh, Brexit, I, I would be particularly interested in the panel's view about um, what impact that will have on uh, business support, um, given that uh, European structural funds and ERDF have been particularly important um, in this uh, regard, and um, also whether the, the, the nature of business support in terms of you know, how it's provided and indeed the level of support that SMEs will, will require, whether that will change, uh, if so, you know, why and how. Um, and I'll start with Mr Dixon. I think with Business Loan Scotland as we currently exist uh, has received European funding. And that comes to an end for us at the end of December. Uh, we've been offered uh, to move into a new debt fund in partnership with the Scottish Government uh, from January, uh, and we're looking to, to conclude that. But I think with the lack of ERDF funding that is going to, to, to be there, then clearly there's going to be a reduction in resources that are available to business support services, uh, to perhaps Business Gateway in terms of the funding that they are able to add to their core service using ERDF funding. So I think without replacing that ERDF funding, then there's, there's got to be, I think, a reduction in uh, the level of service, the level of resources that are available for business support uh, programs. I think as far as a customer's concerned, I think Brexit obviously uh, increases the level of, level of uncertainty in terms of what's going to happen. I think that's going to place uh, a degree of not knowing what is going to happen post uh, Brexit and, uh, and leading up to Brexit, and I think that will clearly have implications on working capital requirements, cash flow requirements uh, for businesses um, as they try to understand what is going to happen to their customers and their suppliers. So I think something uh, funds like Business Loan Scotland or the new fund from next year uh, may well uh, have to, to, to come in and support businesses uh, with capital working requirements, cash flow requirements, probably more than we've done to date. Okay, thank you. And Mr Devine? Um, I would echo many of the things that, that, that Andrew said, particularly around uncertainty. Um, businesses like certainty. They, they like to be able to plan for the future based on a 
I suppose, known outcomes. And, and right now, we, we, we don't have that. Um, within the Royal Bank, we will continue to do um, what, we, what we currently do, where we will sit down with any customer to discuss any concerns that they have. Um, and we have experts on hand who are able to, to talk either in general terms or to, to answer specific queries that, that, that may affect you know, one business or another. Okay. Professor, is this an area you'd like to comment on? <laughs> I'd like this one, yeah. The, um, the business gateway funding has been at best static for the last eight years or so. Um, and that does nothing to help innovate and try new things. Um, however, with the introduction of ERDF funding, that's been a welcome addition uh, to that. So we have a we run a business accelerator in Dundee University, which is <coughs> hugely successful, but it's staffed by people who are funded through the ERDF programme. We also have in Aberdeen a, a diagnostic review system, which we've been able to implement again through ERDF. It's been able to really add value to the to the core business gateway funding as we see it. So if that's ultimately lost, um, yeah, there'll, there'll be this, some decisions to make about how that's how it doesn't hamper us trying new things and are able to develop services, because it's it's definitely um, it's definitely filled a gap where. Uh, business Gateway, as I say, has been a, a fairly static income line. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I wondered if I could uh, start with yourself, Professor, whether um, you had any views about what we could learn from business support uh, in other parts of Europe and in other parts of the UK in terms of what works well and what works less well elsewhere. Yeah, sure. Um, so in, I think what we have in Aberdeen and Dundee is, is a manifestation of the best that I could find in Europe or in the States. In fact, uh, Babson College, which is a number one university for entrepreneurship in the States, tweeted recently that having seen the Aberdeen uh, Business Gateway facility, they said there was nothing better in the US, which was a, a great endorsement. But the, the best cities and regions to create, um, are creating entrepreneurial cultures within them. Business Gateway is a service which, which is part of an ecosystem, but it's not the ecosystem. It's part of it. Um, and really it's, in, it's incumbent on us to create entrepreneurial communities. Uh, and all the big cities, if you take Barcelona, for instance, uh, they have a great example of having just about as many people as Scotland has yet. They only have one place where all the entrepreneurs go. But it's it's filled with energy and and integration, uh, and that's that's definitely the the way to do it. We created such a centre in Aberdeen uh, four years ago now, um, and were recently audited by Ecos. Um, but we we are generating in that centre fourteen percent of the business gateway startups annually, despite only having eight percent of the population. So it's been truly transformational in, in creating an entrepreneurial culture. There's there's lots we can learn. In Activa, we copy it. We have we have every single bank represented in the space where they work side by side by the advisors. Mm -hmm. We've created an open access space where the public can walk in. There's no formality around it. There's no reception, no badges. They just if they want to speak to business advisors, they just speak to business advisors. They're all there. Um, so there's there's lots we can learn from some of the some of the continental ways of doing things uh, that that really do generate great amounts of energy. So you know I, I think we've been I'd like you to see that actually in action. But you know to have such a centre in the main cities of the and connect them all up in Scotland because we connect our Dundee facility and Aberdeen facility and the energy in these two two places now is is, is quite palpable. Um, so, yeah, there's lots to learn, uh, we, but we need to look outside Scotland sometimes just to get some inspiration from what they do in other places. Okay, thank you very much for that. Do other members of the panel wish to uh, contribute about what we can learn from elsewhere in the UK or, or further afield? I'm not sure I can say more than what uh, Professor McEwen's added, but where it works particularly well in Scotland and we need it somewhere else in Scotland, we should actually be making sure that that type of resource and service is absolutely uh, available. Um, what I have heard anecdotally from other people who come up uh, to see the system uh, and the service that we have in Scotland is that uh, we are well uh, 
businesses and entrepreneurs are well served, I believe, compared to other parts of the, the UK. So we have a good system in place through the Business Gateway Service. I think we're much more joined up than we were a good number of years ago. Certainly the Gateway Service has been transferred over to responsibility uh, under the local authority uh, umbrella and COSLA. And I think that's been a move in the, in the right direction. Okay, thank you. Mr Devine? Um, I think my colleagues are, are better placed to talk about um, provision in, in other countries. Um, what, what I would add is that um, you know, the, the, the ecosystem um, is the important part here, where we, we've got different bodies who are connected, who can um, point customers um, or businesses to other agencies, to, to, to other areas where support can be can be given. Um, Scotland is, is, is well served in terms of accelerator hubs. Um, we have two of our own, one in Edinburgh, one in Glasgow, that, that work very well. Um, so far, we've, we've helped around about 800 businesses. They, in turn, have created 2,000 jobs. Um, a really important stat, as far as I'm concerned, is that these businesses who are given that type of support, um, typically the, the survival rate after 18 months is around about 85% as opposed to the UK average of 20% survival rates without that sort of, uh, without that sort of support. Um, so clearly we are, we are doing some things very well. It's just making sure that we are touching as many businesses in Scotland as we, as we possibly can. Okay. And my final question, convener, for, for, for all panel members. Um, given that all the evidence shows that addressing underrepresentation of women in the economy and other groups, whether it's uh, people from a BME background, people with disabilities or folk from more disadvantaged areas, that if we uh, tap into all the talents, that that's good for business, it's good uh, for our economy. So I wonder if the panel would agree with that and if they could share with the committee uh, what they are uh, doing to address the underrepresentation of particular groups in our economy. And I'll start with Mr Dixon. OK, thank you. Yes, I absolutely agree with what, you, what you've said there. Um, where I'm coming from is trying to make sure that a business, any business that needs to access finance is able to do so, irrespective of who's leading that business or who owns uh, that business. So what I'm trying to do is make sure that the supply of access to finance <coughs> is there uh, for businesses as and, when, as and when they require. But yes, we do measure how many female entrepreneurs we have supported how many businesses are, are led by, by females. And I think that's generally increasing over the last number of years. I think predominantly the number of businesses that are owned by males um, is about 75%. Uh, I think about 10 to 12% of what we do is uh, female uh, businesses that are owned. Uh, and where we're, we're measure, able to measure businesses that are jointly owned, um, it's, uh, it makes up the balance. So I would look to my colleagues in the local authorities and the Business Gateway Service to make sure that our message is being spread far and wide uh, to the businesses that they're working with uh, so that if that business actually has a need for funding, then we are uh, one of those uh, options. Okay. Committee heard evidence a few weeks ago from Women's Enterprise uh, Scotland who uh, pointed to some very uh, stark statistics uh, about women being far less likely than their male counterparts to be able to access uh, finance uh, in the first place. Um, and some of that was about how uh, services were articulated, uh, presented, uh, targeted. They weren't gender aware and that there was also some... Um, uh, inherent views about particular types of businesses and uh, some businesses being written off as uh, lifestyle businesses. So, you know, I appreciate that, Mr Dixon, that you are uh, uh, quantifying and, and, and counting uh, the representation of women, and I would hope other groups, but what, what specifically has been done to reach those that are underrepresented in receiving uh, services? We, well, we've got uh, an active uh, marketing uh, campaign that tries to spread our message uh, right across Scotland uh, in a number of uh, channels. <coughs> We're very active online using social media to try and get our message across that we are open for business, that we're there to support businesses that can't raise all the funds from the private sector. So we're using social media as part of our marketing campaign. We're doing um, adverts and 
uh, case studies uh, across a number of media channels also, whether it be publications or newspapers. So we're, I'm trying to spread the message that um, if you're a business, irrespective of uh, who's running that business, if you're looking for funding, then we might be able to help you fill that uh, particular uh, gap in need. Okay. Uh, Mr Devine, given that uh, SMEs and people running SMEs aren't a, a homogenous group, and we've also heard evidence from uh, the Women's Enterprise Scotland that just um, uh, trying to remarket and uh, retarget the same old products doesn't necessarily uh, address issues of, of, of under-representation. I'd be particularly interested um, in what, what the banking sector is doing. Um. We, we seek to offer the, the right support and the right solutions to, to any customer who sits in front of us, irrespective of their, their, their background. However, I do recognise the, the point that you're making, particularly around um, women-led businesses. Um, so, in, in terms of the Royal Bank, um, we have worked closely with Women's Enterprise Scotland for the last five years. Um, we have 60 women in business specialists um, in, in Scotland. Um, last year, they organised and ran 300 female-focused events um, across the, the whole country. Um, these were attended by 11,000 women, um, uh, and we looked at subjects such as, you know, women in agriculture, women in leadership, you know, quite a broad range of, of different topics. In terms of the, the, the two entrepreneur, the entrepreneurial hubs that, that we have, um, which are there to support businesses that have the, the, the ambition and potential to, to grow. 43% um, of the, the candidates who are going through that programme are female-led businesses. So we're not quite at the 50% the mark yet, but um, we are certainly very aware of our responsibilities to, to, to help female entrepreneurs and, and female business owners, um, and we, we, we will seek to, to continue to do that. Okay, and uh, Professor McEwen? <clears throat> this is a changing environment because we have, uh, I remember back in the mid-90s, Scottish Enterprise had a, a target of 15% of female-led entrepreneurship, um, which was seemed very aspirational at the time. But for the last two years in, in the Aberdeenshire uh, area, uh, more, than half of the more than half of the entrepreneurs who have started business in those two years have been female-led businesses. So it's come on you know, it's come on a lot. But we have two issues in Scotland. The first is to, we need to help more businesses to start up. Um, perhaps, I think we've been limited. The Scottish Government has a, a start-up target which amounts to around 10,000, I think, nationally. Somebody must have decided at one time that that was a, a barometer of our entrepreneurial health. I don't know where it came from, but it, it should go because, to me, it limits, it limits ambition. Um, what could we really achieve as a country if we take the lid off that? Um, but how we're going to achieve more is by unlocking the untapped potential of the sort of latent entrepreneurship that, that lies in all the groups that you've just spoken about. And when you really do give it a focus like we have done with women's entrepreneurship, the results can be quite, uh, quite startling. Young people is another one where we need to join that up better. We need to be teaching entrepreneurship at a very young age and making it a normal thing for a young person to come through their life and expect that one day they will run and be a wealth creator. Um, so we need to do all these things inclusively. There's no point in repeating the same mantras to the same people all the time that are going to be entrepreneurs anyway. We have to unlock the potential of the entire country and inclusively grow our economy that way. Okay, thank you very much. You... Thank you, Willie Coffey. Thank you very much. Convener, I wonder if I could just uh, explore a little bit with you the experience with uh, Business Gateway over the, the 10 years or so. Um, I remember Convener being in the Parliament when the transition took place from the Enterprise Networks to Business Gateway providing that localised support. So it was just to get your thoughts on how the model has worked over the, over the period in, in terms of the level of support and advice that small businesses get in the local communities using that model. Well, we couldn't uh, deliver the loans that we uh, put into small businesses without the Business Gateway Service and without the wider local authority economic development teams that are there providing services to SMEs across their, their local areas. So I've seen uh, the transition, as you say, uh, from Scottish Enterprise over to COSLA and the local authorities. I've seen a more joined up approach, I would say, over those 10 years. 
I think there's room for improvement. There's some way still to go. I think we are uh, fighting against uh, a decline in resources and particularly uh, staff that are in the Business Gateway Service and, and local authorities generally uh, as budgets are under uh, pressure. But I think we couldn't do what we need to do uh, without the Business Gateway Service and advisors uh, that, are, that are there. Um, I think my fellow panellists are in a better position to, to, to describe the, the support from Business Gateway rather than the, the, the bank. I would categorise our relationship with Business Gateway at being very much at a local level where our local relationship manager or business growth enabler will have a contact within um, the, the, the local Business Gateway. Um, and the strength of that relationship will, will probably be determined by the individuals concerned. Um, at national level, um, I'm not aware of um, any um, formal um, relationship between Gateway at Scotland level and the Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, we don't, for instance, see specific figures on um, you know, the, the, the metrics that the, the, the Gateway record. Okay. Professor McEwen, any views on that? The when Scottish Enterprise had Business Gateway, um, I think it was a good thing that it went to local authorities because they have a they have a better sense of what, what is happening locally and the local needs. Um, there was an attempt to standardise the offering of Business Gateway so that regardless of the area, you got exactly the same thing. But that has, over the years, fragmented slightly so that each area offers something slightly different. I don't think that's a bad thing because we are a small country, but there are very different needs in different parts of this country. Um, having travelled extensively and looked specifically at the business support available in other European countries and in, uh, in the Americas, I found nothing better than Business Gateway. I found nothing better. It's not perfect. Um, it has gaps. But there is a model in there which, um, if it's built right and delivered correctly, um, is, is a gem of our country. Mm. And we shouldn't forget, because in many countries, small businesses are left to languish and find their way. Um, so, yeah, it will have its critics, but I would, I would invite those critics to go and see what happens in other countries. Mm. See, see those uh, other problems that you referred to earlier, you were talking about its, its difficulty in navigating the variety of funding mechanisms and so on, and every small business seems to, to, to almost be uh, having to appoint a finance director and concentrate on finding money. Were those issues there before the gateway model appeared, and have we made it worse, do you think? You know? We certainly haven't made it worse. I mean, if without Business Gateway to help you navigate, it, it would be like flying a plane without a navigator. Uh, <laughs> you know, for a, for a business to try and navigate its way through a f funding rounds would be a real challenge if they didn't have someone to show them the way. But even the people showing the way, you know, are, are often overwhelmed by the, the changes that are constantly happening in that market. And that kind of simplifying process that you've, you've mentioned that from your experience in Europe and elsewhere, is that, is that a direction of travel that we should really begin to, to start to develop and embrace much more across There's Scotland? some interesting things. Uh, in Spain, for instance, the, the banks work alongside their equivalent to Business Gateway. Um, and so once the person has been through a, an extensive period of learning and business planning over a six-month period, often as long as that, the bank take a very different view on the proposition. And if it's funded, they, they're charged 2% less than standard rate. There really is an integration between how we as Business Gateway develop people to make them less uh, risky um, so that they can meet the bank halfway. Um, there's, there's, still a, there's still a disconnect that we could probably improve uh, by maybe coming to some better cohesion about how we hand clients on through the process. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things I noticed, Convener, when, um, when Enterprise was still there, it was Enterprise Ayrshire in my case, was the presentation to me, perhaps quarterly, of what was happening in my constituency in terms of new business startups, our performance of local businesses and so on and so forth. That was kind of lost, I felt, when it moved off to Business Gateway. Perhaps they didn't feel they were the custodian or or were responsible for delivering that kind of business information. Where, where do you see, where does that lie now, currently, if any of our members around the table was to ask for a complete business profile for their 
Scottish parliamentary constituency. I'd be happy. Um, I think it will be fragmented across because there's so many different ways of delivering business gateway, which is uh, another point. But um, in the last Friday of every month in Aberdeen City and Shire, we invite you know MSPs or local authority councillors to to come and have an update on you know how things are going. So this this coming Friday, I believe we have our our next one, um, and so we we find it really important that quite often uh, local politicians don't know exactly what's going on in the area in terms of how they're doing economically and how the startup culture is developing. And it's, they find that they get a lot out of it if they take the time to come along. Okay. I can certainly give you the stats in terms of what we've done as Business Law in Scotland over the last 18 months. I can certainly share that with you uh, after, after today. I believe stats are recorded uh, for the Business Gateway Service for, for the whole of Scotland, and that's probably a question you need to ask Business Gateway in terms of what does that mean for Ayrshire, uh, in particular, or East Ayrshire uh, specifically. But uh, they must be measuring what they're, what they're doing, and it's a matter of communicating that uh, to the appropriate, uh, mm -hmm. appropriate uh, I find individuals. Just, I just find that it's very rarely available on a constituency basis. It's usually a local authority or some other boundary. I, say, I do find it's very rare indeed that we get it on a constituency basis, which would be of greater, greater interest probably to, to colleagues. But we that, should have, we should have. report on a local authority yeah. area, so I could tell you how many businesses we've, we've supported in, in each of the, the local authority okay. areas. Okay, thank you. It, it might be interesting if that if you could give us that in writing, perhaps if that's possible, that yeah. might help the, the committee. Right, thank you. Um, now, Gordon McDonald. Thanks so much, Just to continue the, the conversation that Wally Coffey started, um, when you look at the, um, the level of support that's out there, uh, in addition to financing for small companies and startups and new entrepreneurs, they've got a wide range of business advice from the banks, from the Chamber of Commerce, sometimes from the Federation of Small Businesses, and obviously Business Gateway. So, but. Even this morning, we've heard a, a range of uh, comments from Scotland is much more joined up than other parts of the UK, yet SMEs are not totally aware of services and finance available, and there is a need for better signposting, that's just from this morning. So, you know, how do we improve collaboration between all the different organisations that are involved in uh, giving better uh, business advice? Very good question. Um, I'm not sure I can answer that to give you a definitive answer. What would uh, you like to see change? Um, my priority is to get the message out there that Business Loan Scotland, we <coughs> exist. And the route for a business to come in seeking funding from ourselves is either through the Business Gateway Service, sometimes the local authority of business advisors, Sometimes it's the accountants. That's predominantly where we get uh, our referrals and the applications that are coming to, to, to Business Loan Scotland. It's a constant battle to try and keep that awareness out there, certainly amongst a lot of the, uh, the organisations that are there to represent members, like the Chambers of Commerce, uh, the Scottish Chambers, the Federation of Small Business, as, as you've mentioned. So it's a continual battle to make sure that they are aware of what we can do. We're there to fill that gap in the market but we don't know when that business is going to be looking for funding at that point in time. But we need to make sure that the, the, whole, the whole of Scotland is aware that, yes, they can come and approach us if it's absolutely appropriate and relevant to, to do so. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but there is more to be done. We need to be able to do more, and we just need to make sure that uh, people are aware um, of the different sources uh, of funding particularly from my perspective, and those sources of funding have been increasing over the last number of years. So there is more choice and there is more availability. <coughs> and it's trying to make sure that all the stakeholders um, are, are joined up and connected. Mm -hmm. um, I think businesses like information and they, they like recommendations. Um, from a Royal Bank perspective, um, we, we can understand that, for instance, Business Gateway is 
um, a, a standalone in independent body who, who may not want to, to be seen to be um, too close to one or you know any particular bank. Um, but what, what would be useful for, for us would be to, to be able to share specific good news stories or spe specific statistics with our customers that could endorse you know the benefits of going to, to business gateway, mm -hmm. be it you know looking at survival rates, be it um, access to, 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 to funding, you know jobs created. Um, right now we, we don't see specific, statistics that, that we can share with our customers to say this is the benefit of going to to business gateway this is why we can re recommend that service and i think as a as a default many of our customers will, will will kind of then just go and see their accountant because that's the person that they they know they trust they've got that that relationship built up as opposed to to going to to, to you know gateway or you know any other body where we, we we don't have the the evidence to say this is why it could be very good for your business. Just in in that terms, uh, spirit of collaboration. You said businesses like information, and as far as I'm aware, RBS is still the largest provider of uh, banking facilities to businesses in Scotland. Would would uh, RBS consider carrying posters and leaflets for, for Business Gateway to highlight the services that are available from Business Gateway? We, we will do anything um, that will support our customers and the local communities. Um, so if we, if we can share information with our, our customers, we'd be delighted to do so. Okay, thank you. I think um, your, your original question talks about business advice from FSB and mm -hmm. Chambers of Commerce. I'd be surprised if those organisations would suggest that they give business advice. Well, more training they offer from yeah. time to time. So there is an ecosystem out there. I think yeah. the um, uh, this country will work because the ecosystem will, will learn to work together. The model that we've chosen to create, as I say, was based on other models. So we have Business Gateway at the very heart of what we do because the clue's in the name. Business Gateway should be the yeah. gateway to everywhere you need to go. Uh, so when you walk into our, our centre in Aberdeen or, or Dundee, um, you will be able to interact with Business Gateway. It's the heartbeat. But also in the same space, we have banks represented, we have accountants and lawyers, we have the planning department of the local authority, we, we have the Chamber of Commerce are downstairs, FSB are in regularly. And so the concept of creating a regional hub of entrepreneurship it's the go-to place, but it's the place where you go, you'll be able to access everything you need so that the navigation is less difficult. That's my, my vision is to see what we've created, replicated in all our cities and connected up. And then that would be best in class globally, I would say. And has that been replicated anywhere else in Scotland other than the areas that you, you referred to? Um, we work quite closely with Fife. Um, they, they wanted to do something similar. They've, they, they've done... They've done a version of that, um, but it, it's, a, it's on a small scale. Uh, but you know, to to have it all fragmented for people to go along to kind of vanilla spaces where they fail to be inspired, fail to be able to integrate and have peer-to-peer -peer support it is not the way forward. To me, the way forward is 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 to have larger regional centres where where you will see. An example of um, you know how you get eight or nine percent of the population to produce fourteen percent of the startups. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you do that. Okay. Um, another way of getting the message across is about effective marketing. And w again, previously we've heard conflicting evidence, uh, and uh, some of the written evidence we've had previously. Uh, ranging from Business Gateway is a well-known brand amongst the public and the service is easy to contact, to there is a lack of real marketing effort that continues to inhibit the reach of the service to new companies. So how effective do you think Business Gateway marketing is and you know, what needs to change in order to get that message across? Okay, that's okay. Right, on you go. <laughs> um, there's a core business gateway marketing team, which, and I think they do a, a great job. At first, um, they, they controlled everything. Um, however, over the years, there's been more budget released locally to do local marketing, um, mm -hmm. using local phone numbers. 
We also do a lot of marketing on our own, and, and that combined effort works for us. Um, they, they advertise on TV, which is you know, it's great to be on national uh, national TV. I think it, it works quite well, but the, we could always improve on these things. But the, the core marketing team are, are only part of the solution. The, the local authority could market it probably better, and then the, whoever's delivering it could also market it. And for us, that those three prongs uh, add up to, uh, I think, a fairly decent penetration of the, the business community. Mm -hmm. There, there was a suggestion from some evidence we heard on one of our visits that television was one expensive uh, to get that advert across and would not necessarily reach the target audience, given that the younger people tend to watch television differently from, you know, years ago, and also are not necessarily watching television when they're out building a business. So, you know, there should be more um, effective ways of, of delivering that marketing whether it's social media or whether it's um, using leafleting in various places where um, people could be like at, at um, airports or libraries or bank branches, for instance. Would that be more effective? Or? Well, I'm, I'm not a marketing expert. I'm sure the marketing teams would, would come to their own conclusions uh, around that. What, what I would say is, though, that the, the Business Gateway brand is... You know, it's a very, very well-known brand in Scotland now. Um, prior to that, all the local enterprise companies had their own little brands. We had First Business in Renfrewshire. We had, uh, we had all sorts of names, uh, and there was no identity. It really does have an identity. People, I think, do know that Business Gateway is the, the go-to place, but the mechanisms they use, well, I would hope that they'll be as innovative as they can be and, and realise that there's different ways of marketing t through social media, etc. Okay. Anybody else? I think it's a combination of all those outlets and all those channels to get that message across because you don't know when that person's going to be parked, uh, parked at the traffic lights, look at the billboard, and then you've got the business gateway being, being promoted. Mm -hmm. But the, the bit for me more recently, which has really, I think, struck a chord, is where you've seen case studies and examples of businesses that have received that support from the business gateway. And I think, by and large, Businesses can identify with business and they understand that that particular type of business, that sector, that segment uh, have, has been able to get that level of support from the business gateway. And I think if they can get it, then perhaps I can get it as well. And I think using case studies, real life case studies and examples, uh, I think just does that little bit extra for me in terms of, of actually selling what the Business Gateway Service is, is all about and what it can do and achieve, hopefully, for your business. So, certainly that was a message that those of us that were at Dublin yesterday speaking to Enterprise Ireland got across that, you know, exam real-life examples mm. is a better way of getting your message across, so yeah. I, would, I would agree. Mr Devine, you get anything to add? I, I don't have anything to add. Okay. My, my last question is about um, how do we deliver a minimum level of quality service across the country. Again, we've heard conflicting evidence. One said that uh, having the setup that we do um, provides flexibility tailored to local needs and circumstances. However, we've also heard evidence that says the quality of service is highly dependent on the skills and experience of the advisor. So, uh, you know, what do we need to do to make sure that there is at least a minimum? consistency of support across the country? Um, I, I, th I think that any service that's being delivered will always be down to the, the, the quality of the individual who's, who's sat in front of you. Um, generally speaking, um, the, the anecdotes that, that we get back about Business Gateway um, are, are very positive. Um, our customers tell us that they, they in the main, have good experiences. However, in the run-up to, um, to, to appearing here today, um, I did canvas some, some views, um, and I suppose people always want to tell you the extremes. So we, we got the, the one case of a retailer out in Lanarkshire who wanted to, to go and get a grant so that they could set up online. And things were incredibly slick, fast, and they got what they, they, they wanted um, very quickly. Equally, I, I spoke to an accountant who, who told me of a business in Edinburgh where it took six months to get to the point where they thought funding had been agreed, only for a new manager to, to, to come in who decided that he 
personally wanted to review every single application that was um, in the office. Um, and so that funding has, has stalled and there's no um, immediate timescales on, on, on when a conclusion will be reached. So I think, generally speaking, Business Gateway is a, a recognised and trusted brand, um, but it will always come down to the individuals who are, are there, which I think is why it's important that we, we have um, recognised metrics that, that, that we record, that we publish, so that we can see whether SLAs are being achieved. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm happy to. Uh, the uh, this was this problem was um, addressed some time ago with the introduction of the Premier Advisor Programme. So all business advisors in Scotland within a year of employment have to um, pass a set of exams to to be able to work in the Business Gateway Service. I'm quite closely involved in that process um, as an assessor, uh, but the the bar is not particularly high. I, I don't think it, it. So we could consider making it tougher. Um, I also think that the business advisors who are dealing with startup businesses and the ones who are dealing with growing companies need to be, have different sets of skills themselves, and yet we only have one qualification, which is at that lower level. So I get uh, twitchy when it comes to people who might cross that bar but are actually trying to work with companies and they're out their depth. I think we need to have perhaps different. We also don't have any um, CPD after. So once they qualify, they qualify. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a, I think we should have a, a continuous improvement of the business advisory support. Um, I think we could probably do better at monitoring. As a business gateway provider, I can tell you intimately what's going on in the areas where we are involved. But I couldn't tell you how anywhere else is doing because nobody, it's not published. Um, there's no cohesion between our advisory teams and the ones in, you know, Fife or Glasgow. We we don't talk, um, so there's there's a lack of sharing of best practice. There's lots we could do uh, actually to make all of the. There's about six or seven hundred business advisors operating. We could all go up a few notches uh, quite easily if we did some simple things. Okay. I've nothing really to to add to add to that. It does, it does come down to the people and to the skills and their abilities to be able to advise the business with the best information, the best advice that they need at that point in time. Okay, thanks so much. Um, Tom Mason. Uh, th thank you, Kavina. Um, I sort of harp back some 20 years and, and the conversation we're having, we could have had then. And not, not too much has changed, although I am encouraged by what's going on in, in the North East in terms of the start-up and, and the elevator activity. My question really is of whether we are uh, uh, some alternative models to what we are doing to make sure we get sustainability in the numbers. If we've got the start-up, you know, the enterprise going and, as, on the start-up, whether that's materialising into sustainable businesses and, and by what proportion. And I, I'm also conscious that entrepreneurs don't actually like borrowing money on in, in sort of overdraft terms because it's so risky for them because it, 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 for no fault of their own the, the, the money can be just withdrawn or has, has you know it's not secure to them and some form of much longer term investment in the companies might be appropriate. What hasn't been discussed in any way it has been uh, sales levies in terms of uh, investment as because people don't like taking equity too early in the business to lose control. And the opportunity for making money out of it disappears. But some alternative way of investing in the, in the medium to long term might be appropriate. Just your, your views would be appreciated. I'd be quite happy to pick up the first question, mm -hmm. perhaps less so the second mm -hmm. uh, question, on, on sustainability. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we do have two challenges in this country. One is to start more businesses, and the other is to help more of them grow mm -hmm. to be significant. Um, Business Gateway's shortfall is that it, it, it doesn't do a whole lot to create an entrepreneurial environment to encourage people to get to the start line. It is a responsive, reactive service. When someone wants business advice, they can have it. But we've chosen to, as a, as a social enterprise, um, we, take it, we take our surpluses and invest it in the, in the early stages to try and help more people get to the start line. 
But then the other part of the equation is what we do with the ones that have now started and are beginning to grow, because they need a they need a level of education which is quite different from that which Business Gateway will offer them. And so we invest in the other end of, of trying to get more of them to grow. So our modelling is around trying to create a surplus as a social enterprise, put Business Gateway in the middle of what we do and use our surpluses to invest in the parts that Business Gateway don't do to make sure that we have an end-to-end -end, uh, service. Um, so the, the ECOS report highlights that as quite unique, um, which I think was submitted as part of our written submission. But they, they suggest that for every, for every pound of surplus we're investing at that pre pre-start stage and every pound that we invest post-start, we have managed to unlock another three pounds of private sector investment into that process. And that in turn, they allude to a, a GVE of £21 for every pound that we spend. Um, so it's a model of recycling wealth back into our, our community and making sure that while Business Gateway is the heart, it's not the complete body. We have to fill in, we have to make sure we've got more entrepreneurs coming through to the process. And we've got a way of handling the growth aspirations of those who come out of the process. As a loan fund, we are in the risk business. Uh, we are there to take that risk when the private sector and the banks particularly won't take that risk for the reasons I, I, gave, I gave earlier. So for me as a loan fund, I'm trying to make sure that the businesses are adequately funded, not the minimum that they need to get that project delivered, but they've actually got some headroom so that they can weather any storms that are coming round the corner that we can't foresee, we can't forecast, and therefore to make sure that they've got that headroom, they've got the, the cash flow behind them to actually deal with any uh, downturns in supply, demand, whatever, whatever it might be. And it's just trying to make sure the businesses are adequately funded uh, where, as I say, they can weather weather those storms. But what of the issue of the of the banks, your, yourself and things, withdrawing funding from the, for, for no reason of the, the, the enterprise, but for our external reasons, and, and, in, and in fact interest rates rising, as they might well do over the next five, ten years? Because um, that, that, that represents a risk to the business, which they don't want to, you know, they might be, they might be sustainable at the present interest rates, but not sustainable to higher interest rates. So, as, as I touched on earlier on, one, one of the things that we do as a responsible lender is, is to look at both the current situation, but also to look at the future in terms of what ifs. So, what if interest rates do, do rise? So, um, for instance, when, when we're assessing a, a lending application, we will take that into account in terms of if interest rates go up, can that business afford to service the debt? Similarly, with turnover, we will look at, you know, is, is the level of turnover sustainable? Um, what would happen if turnover did drop? It's not in our interest, it's not in a customer interest to, to lend money that isn't going to be affordable in, in years to come. But, but equally, you know, like Andrew said, we are in the, the, the risk business. So we, we will seek to lend funds where it's appropriate to do so, where it's the right thing for our customer, and it's the, the, the right thing for the bank. But, but in the end of the day, you're not in the risk business, because, I mean, as, as Professor McGowan said, you know, the, the company's in the risk business, the banks are not. Uh, and, and, and you're going to, whereas some form of other equity type investment is much more appropriate for get, going from the sort of beginning of startup or somewhere which is demonstrating a viable business into something which can be sustained over four, five, or even ten years. Because your 18 months figure of being successful, to me, is not a, a measure at all. So I, I, I would respectfully disagree with you, Mr. Mason, in terms of whether we're in the, the, the risk business or not, um, because we, we are lending more and more funds on an unsecured basis to both new and existing customers, where we are, are looking at that business as a, as a viable proposition that can afford to, to repay funds back over three, five, ten years. Um, but we, we lend that money without any explicit guarantees. There is no guarantees that every company that we lend to will still be there in, in ten years' time. So we are in the risk business. We, we seek to, to, to minimise the risk to, for the benefit of both the bank and our customer. 
again, I would reiterate, it's not in a customer's interest to borrow money that they are not going to be in a position to pay back in, in the future. Yeah, but what I'm looking for is, is there some, some alternative model other than just lending straight money with, with an interest payment? And some equities. I mean, what, what, what about a sales levy system? The, the old-fashioned NRDC used to in, in invest in companies for research and development, and then uh, uh, get its return on, on, the, on a, a, a sales levy basis. Is that, is that not a possibility in the, terms of an alternative model? There, there may be alternative models available. Um, I'm perhaps not in the best position to, to, to answer that question. Anybody got an alternative model to the, sort of what is fairly standard? I think it's horses for, for courses, and it's what's relevant to the business at that point in time. An equity investment might well be uh, appropriate for that business, but the owners and are going to relinquish part control or ownership of, of that business. And generally what we find is that uh, young businesses, new businesses, might end up uh, accessing microfinance, they might then move on to the de debt finance that uh, we can uh, supply, and then further down the line, it might be equity that's appropriate for them uh, at that stage. And there are other forms of finance that are available from the bank, whether it be a higher purchase invoice finance, uh, all uh, that uh, broad gambit of, uh, that, of finance that, that's available. I'm not particularly uh, up to speed with what you referenced there in terms of the, the sort of sales uh, release. Yes, because at the moment I see a, a situation where we've, we've got plenty of people wanting to start, and, and it's moving them through and make them continue on to a great, much greater rate than we're doing at the moment. Because the actual, the actual sustainable entrepreneurial businesses really hasn't improved, you know, dramatically. It's slightly better than it used to be, but it's, it's certainly not anywhere near what we need to do. The, the situation, I don't think there's any new, new models. A, a business can really only either borrow money, it can, be, it can sell equity and it's you know, for in return for cash, or it can be given money in the form of a grant. Uh, and so anything that we create is going to be, perhaps the, the innovation is around how we blend those. I think the Scottish Edge Fund is an example of how you've got different partners with different, Scottish government are in there because they want the economy to be better. Um, the Royal Bank are in there because they see a commercial return. You see a, a welding together and it's more products that, that are cleverly blended to meet the needs of our current entrepreneurs is what we need to do. I don't think we're going to see any radical new models. It's going to be um, amalgamations of previous models. Right, well, thank you. We'll come now to John Mason. Hey, thanks, Convener. And I think to build on some of the questions that have been asked before, um, I mean, I'm in the position now where I'm hearing that there are different ways that Business Gateway is being done around the country, and I'm hearing that Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire are hugely successful. Um, I mean, if I got you correctly, you've got 8% of the population, and then was it 25% are startups or 14%? I think both no. got mentioned. The last few years have been fluctuating between 13 and 14 per cent of the startups of the 10,000. So we right. that that area contributes about 1,300 to 1,400 startups of okay. the 10,000. So I mean that creates the question for me that, as I understand it, there's about 15 million going into core services for a business gateway. How do we, sitting here on the committee, measure is Aberdeen really more successful than Lanarkshire, or is Glasgow's model of a bit all more joined up better or worse? A, is the, do you think we can measure it, or do we just have to say, well, Aberdeen is so different from Lanarkshire, we can't compare them? Well, I think the comparison part would need to be down to your best judgment. Uh, what we've been trying to do is, we had little interest in the Scottish Government target. We, we were given a target by a local authority, <coughs> but for years that was just constraining what we did. What gets measured gets done. And that's... That shows no ambition as a country at all. What we wanted to demonstrate was that if you take away and remove those barriers and really do all the right things that you need to do to create a, an entrepreneurial culture, what, what would happen? What would happen if we took the lid off this thing? So we've, we've taken the lid off for four years now and we can now demonstrate what has come of that. I would, you know, I would love for you to see and experience what that is I'm open to visiting Aberdeen, yes. Pardon me? I'm open to visiting Aberdeen. I mean, you say you've taken the lid off, which suggests that, I mean, is it a contract you've got with the local councils? 
Yes. And and so that lid has been removed. But I mean, we also the the opposite we've heard is that if there's not a con contract with a third party like yourselves, then the council takes it in house and just cuts the target and cuts it and cuts it and cuts it to what they can comfortably do. So that doesn't sound very positive. Again, I'll leave you to be the best judge of of the outcome of that. Uh -huh. I, I have. Um, yeah, what we, what we explained to the local authority was, we understand you've given us a target which is demographically assigned to us, but we have uh, we thought that by focusing on doing the right things that the target would become almost the baseline. So this year, um, it, come probably the middle of December, we will have met our target given to us by Scottish Government, and we've still got to go through till April. Um, so the local authority begin to panic that we're going to uh, you know, close up shop and not del deliver a service, but that's not what we're here for. As an enterprise trust, we are there to continually improve. Mm -hmm. So we're determined to deliver more startups of a higher quality this year than we did last, and mm -hmm. we will again the next year. Mm -hmm. Whether you get that sort of determination and ambition within a local authority is a question that you need to ponder. <laughs> Thank you. And I mean, when it comes to measuring, I mean, something like measuring a startup, I suppose, is relatively straightforward. But we've also had evidence that, you know, in some areas, there's a kind of continuing support uh, for a business that can grow quite big. And yep. Business Gateway is still in there yep. giving help. And I mean, the same might be true of the banks or, uh, or, or anyone else. That kind of stuff's more difficult to measure. I mean, I don't know if either of the others feel that can we measure all of that satisfactorily, or, or can we just can we not? We we don't currently see any data from um, Business Gateway, so um, we are a little bit blind in terms of measuring the the success and 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 what sort of bang we get for our buck. Um, can it be measured? I, I think that we would first of all have to establish, you know, what are the the, the important things? Is it you know survival rate? Is it you know how many um, new jobs are created? Again, you know, similar to Professor McEwen, that would be something for, for you to decide what um, is important. But can it then be subsequently measured? I would argue that. And, and can I ask, if you asked Business Gateway either locally or nationally for that kind of information relationship? No, we haven't. Because, I mean, we've also had a local Business Gateway saying that they were disappointed because they were trying to do advice for small businesses. Royal Bank came into the area, didn't speak to them, started up its own Business, uh, advice for local businesses, and there was just no relationship between the two. I mean, um, is, is there room for improvement in that area? Um, undoubtedly. If, that, if, if that's been the feedback that you've given, then on behalf of the bank, I'll apologise for that. Um, we, we don't seek to come into an area and take over. We want to be part of that local ecosystem um, where we, we can work collaboratively, where we can recognise the things that we do very well, but equally we can recognise um, either events or services that a gateway can offer that we can make our customers aware of so that they get the benefit of, I suppose, both worlds. Okay, thanks. Sorry, Mr Dixon, I don't know if you wanted to say anything. I probably can't add much more than what's already been, uh, been said, but for me it's about the journey. Where are we now and where do we want to end up? And I think we do need to be able to measure what we're doing how much input are we putting into the business gateway service, how much money, how much staff resources, and ultimately, what difference are we making? Because if we're not making any difference, why are we doing it? So, so can we measure it? Can we compare one area with another? That's probably a question for the business, business gateway. I, I can tell you what we measure as far as Business Loan Scotland is, is concerned, and I can tell you what uh, we're doing in each of the geographies that we take down to the local authority level. But, uh, so I know how much our inputs are into Business Loan Scotland. I know how many businesses we've supported. Uh, we're monitoring our businesses uh, after uh, 12 months of that investment going in. I can tell you how many jobs those businesses, those businesses have created uh, in that period of time. And I can also tell you what increase their turnover has gone up or, or sometimes the turnover decreases. So I can t tell you that information, certainly from my perspective. But I think... Yes, we need to be able to measure what we're what we're doing. Okay, and my final point would be uh, around the strategic board. Um, now, I don't know that it is going to have a specific relationship with Business Gateway, but um, do you think it can create a more joined up business support environment? Is that a hope? The 
we are a we are a small country, uh, albeit a fantastic small country, and we we could be doing with uh, anything that allows us to collaborate more. Uh, the, the concept of the overarching strategic board bringing together the, the key organisations to work more closely together that that can't be bad. It, it can't be a bad thing. But once you come down to the level of business support, it becomes rather more diluted. Um, and so we could we could learn lessons about how we collaborate across to, to create this ecosystem. Um, and I think I think we're doing that. I only observe really what the strategic board is doing in relation to Scottish Enterprise and the Scottish Funding Council and allowing them to integrate their services more. And it's exactly what should be happening. But once that comes down to business support level, I'm not sure that it's particularly apparent to most people what it's doing. Um, but I'm sure it is doing good things. Okay, well, it's early days yet. Uh, okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Jamie Halko Johnson. Thanks very much, convener, and welcome to the panel. Um, just, uh, uh, um, I've got two questions, one very quick, which is, uh, is to Keith, Keith Devine, and I should probably say that uh, I'm a partner in a small business um, which also banks with RBS, but I just wanted to get an idea, given the, um, uh, given the kind of proportion of uh, businesses that uh, use yourself and um, Bank of Scotland, I think 60%, according to the survey, a lack of switching with, within the market, but also we've seen quite a lot of bank closures over the last few years, and I'm speaking tomorrow in a debate on the current round with uh, the Bank of Scotland. I just wondered what your analysis had been or what analysis had been done in terms of the either the positive or negative impact of those bank closures on being able to deliver business support, particularly in rural areas like the Highlands and Islands that I re uh, represent. Um, we're very proud of the fact that, that one in three Scottish businesses bank with us they, they've chosen to bank with us, they've chosen to, to, to stay with us. Um, it's a competitive market, um, and so the, the, the fact that, that these businesses do continue to, to, to thrive uh, and choose us as their banking partner tells us that, in the main, that the services that we are offering our customers meets their needs. Um, whilst whilst branch, branch closures have occurred, um, We've, we've trebled the, the number of points at which our customers can um, do basic banking transactions, pay in, take cash out over the last five years um, through our relationship with the, the post office, through our, um, our, our network of, of mobile branches that, that drive 8,000 miles a week across, across Scotland. Um, we've continued to, to innovate um, where we are, are using our digital services um, very well. Um, and making sure that um, customers, irrespective of whether they're in you know, the, the north of Scotland or the south of Scotland, they have access to um, our experts, um, either through the, the, the 65 relationship managers that we have on the ground, um, our eight business growth enablers who are there running events, they're connecting people, but we also have 600 business managers um, who are employed in our contact centre who are there to, to answer customer questions or refer customers to a relationship manager um, if the customer needs to phone outside normal banking hours. So whilst um, customer demand for our branches has, has reduced, um, we are, are still seeking to, to support these Scot uh, customers in Scotland through a variety of ways. Uh, if we look at the, 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 the north, of, north of Scotland, we know, for instance, that um, there's a higher proportion of um, agriculture businesses there. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a dedicated team of agriculture managers. You know, in the central belt, it may be real estate finance specialists, um, it may be healthcare. So we have experts in our local area who can help those local businesses. And we're keen to speak to, to any business who wants to, to engage with us. But increasingly, that, in particular in rural areas, that business advice, that business advice and support, that's been done over the phone or rather than face to face. Um, it, it will be done sometimes by by telephone, but but equally, um, we task our relationship managers of going out to our our business customers' premises, so as that a it's more convenient for the the customer, but it, it gives us a, a better insight into to the business by pitching up. You know, seeing the premises, seeing what needs to be done, having discussions in a place that's convenient for the uh, for the customer, rather than dragging them into to a bank branch. 
Okay, thanks very much. Um, the question I've just widened out a little bit, um, sorry, a question I would give to all panellists. Um, we've talked a lot about business support, and obviously part of the support and the advice is around skills. If you're growing a business, you need, uh, you need the employers to do that with the requisite skills. I'm just wondering how, um, how important that is in terms of the advice and support that you give and how easy it is for you to be able to direct um, those organisations, those businesses that come to you uh, to find the, the skills that are required. Do you mean the, sorry, if I can ask for some clarity, do you mean mm. uh, s skills in a potential workforce, or do you mean the skills that they need to actually grow their business? Sorry, skills in a potential in a potential workforce. So the as a business begins its, its journey, it, it gets to a point, um, and sadly, we reckon only one in twelve companies that start actually ever really become of significance. When I say significance, we, we term that as having maybe eight or nine employees, perhaps. Um, that's something we do need to address, and that's about the, the skills and attributes that the entrepreneur has to develop to be able to do that. I think we have an issue in Scotland around how we educate entrepreneurs. But there, there does come a, an inevitable point when they have to begin to create a workforce. And it's a, you know, that's another really big step for entrepreneurs. And it's, it's so important that they get the, the right people at that point. And so that's when the, the collaboration with um, other organisations becomes important to, to ensure that they not only go through the correct mechanism of how they employ, but they also get the right people. The first few employees are, you know, so important, so important to do that. Um, but the access to that, the, the, it tends then just to go into the conventional, uh, I'm looking for staff, so I'm going to advertise this. Um, the other end of the scale is how we prepare using uh, developing young workforce to have a workforce that's ready to enter these businesses. But the two do tend to meet, you know, reasonably successfully, I feel. Um, but there's there's always scope for more more collaboration. But it's it's a very important point in the development of the company when it first takes on because the, if they take on one person, it's possibly the only time the business will ever double in size. <laughs> You know, and if that's not the right person, it can lead to all sorts of uh, anxiety. So it's it's more, I think, an issue for the entrepreneur and how they select than it is about how they access the right skills. That's maybe further up the, the growth chain. Okay. Um, we recognise that the, the, the quality of our people is what differentiates us between our competitors, um, which is why we have continued to invest in our, our people. So all of our relationship managers go through an accreditation programme that's run through the Chartered Institute of Bankers in Scotland. Um, our business growth enablers are also externally accredited. Um, we've appointed community bankers, um, particularly in, in rural, rural areas. Um, we have tech experts in, in each branch to, to help customers with, with technology. Um, and we, we look at the needs of individual markets. So if we're in a, a, a rural area, we know that we need to have, provide expertise in agriculture. So we will have dedicated relationship managers who, who specialise specialize in that, um, who will know what's happening in the, the industry, who uh, will attend, for instance, a local mart so that they can see what's happening to, to prices, they can speak to multiple customers on the, the same day, really to make sure that our customers know that we're there for them at a time of need and that we are expert in the, the markets that we operate in. Um, we're also lucky that um, you know we, in Gogerburn we've, we've got a, a, an army of experts kind of that are at our disposal. So if we've got a customer who wants to talk about Brexit that our relationship manager can't answer, we can go to our economics team um, who will be happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with, with that customer. Okay, thank you. About a quarter of the businesses that we support we lend to will be new start businesses. So they're starting from zero effectively. Mm -hmm. They have their business plan together and they're looking to get together the funding that they need to get their business up and, up and running. So invariably, we're looking for them to be employing people. Three quarters of the businesses that we support, which I would de describe as, exist as existing businesses, they will go on an average and create about four new jobs per business um, over uh, the next uh, 18 months to, to two years. So again, we're very specialist in, by, in being able to provide the funding that the business needs. 
we would look to the advisors to that business to make sure that that business can tap into the relevant resources and services that uh, are available to talk about recruitment, to talk about skills, uh, and to make sure that the policies and procedures are there uh, as that business uh, becomes an employer uh, and takes on additional members of staff. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you very much to all three of our witnesses for coming in today. Um, that concludes our evidence session with you. So if you wish to uh, leave at this stage, the committee will move on to item three on the agenda. Thank you very much. Item three on the agenda is the Diligence Against Earnings Variation Scotland Regulations 2018, which is a Scottish statutory instrument number 345 of 2018. Um, these regulations will raise the threshold beneath which deductions may not be taken from earnings by arrestment and increase the sum protected from arrestment in a bank account. Um, do any members have any issues they wish to raise? Deputy Convener. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, on the specific issue of the amount being raised, I'm supportive of that, so I don't have a problem with that. I think there, wi there is the wider issue that we've been looking at recently, um, a whole variety of ways that people can have their debts managed. And there do seem to be differences. It, it doesn't all seem very joined up. So in, under one system, a person is allowed one amount to live on. Under another system, it's a completely different amount and or uh, calculated in a different way. And I think it would be useful if at some point we could raise with the government, either in writing or when the minister comes, eh, to kind of discuss that wider issue about is it, I know it's complex, but is it possible as we go forward to make that system eh, a bit more joined up? Committee content with that? Yeah. Very well. Thank you. In that case, if we're agreed the instrument comes into force, subject to that uh, caveat, um, I'll now suspend the meeting and we'll move into private session.